scratching the table. Welcome to the first episode of the Imhoff Archives, a special Flipping the Table series featuring compelling interviews with the icons of the sustainable and regenerative agriculture movement, conducted by writer and activist Dan Imhoff. Dan felt his interview with Kentucky farmer Wendell Berry must be the first episode of the six-part series because Wendell's seminal writings have influenced many of the major voices that have reshaped how we think about agriculture, rural communities, and home economics. In light of my own current focus on livestock agriculture, Wendell's following statement from his interview with Dan really struck me. He says, World War II was the great fulcrum of his life. Prior to that event, farmers had, quote, joined ourselves to the land with sentient animals, end quote. And it allowed for a, quote, creaturely existence. He went on to say that after the war, animals were replaced with machines, and that began what he calls the great oversimplification of agriculture, which he sees as the source of its current problems. He calls on us to mitigate this oversimplification in order to repair the land, farms, and rural economies. At first glance, you might think this statement is wrong, but I urge you to deeply listen and ponder what he says. It may come to make perfect sense for you as it did for me. Please enjoy Dan and Wendell in conversation. Our guest today comes to most of our listeners without a need for an introduction. Wendell Berry is our nation's agrarian poet laureate and an inspiration to millions of Americans who care deeply about the health of our land, our people, our food system, and our democracy. He's the author of 50 books of poetry, fiction, and essays, including Bringing It to the Table and Leavings, both newly released by Counterpoint Press. He has recently been awarded the Kleenth Brooks Medal for Excellence in Southern Letters and the Lewis Bromfield Society Award. For over 50 years, Wendell Berry has lived and farmed with his wife, Tanya, in Kentucky. Wendell, welcome to our program, and thank you so much for being here. Well, thank you very much. That, that was very kind, all that, Dan. Well, I've asked you for many, many years uh, just occasionally, if, if I could get you on our program. And um, I have to say, it's a great honor. I've been really looking forward to this conversation for a long time, and I, I'm very grateful to be here. Well, now let's see if you're right. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, I, I usually start out asking our um, guests if they could describe um, where they are in the world. And usually they're on the place where they're farming or they're gardening. So uh, we're here in San Francisco in a, in a quiet room, but maybe you could take us, if you could, to your farm in Kentucky and give a description of, of your operation there. Well, my um, place in Kentucky um, is a very marginal farm, mostly hillsides. Uh, when our children were young and for some time afterward, we had a very elaborate subsistence um, economy on our place. We had uh, hogs for meat and two milk cows and poultry and a, a large garden and um, our own meat animals and so on. Um, that has um, uh, declined somewhat in diversity. We don't have uh, milk cows or pol poultry anymore, uh, and, but we still do have a garden, and we still have a, a small commercial sheep flock, 
and we still harvest a good bit of our energy, heating energy from the woods. Uh, our place is um, near the Kentucky River in uh, Kentucky. I remember being there. Um, it's more than 15 years ago. I had um, the privilege to stay there with my wife, Quincy. Um, and I remember a walk on the farm. I, I think I definitely remember you milking a cow uh, before dinner and drinking a fresh glass of milk. And I remember donkeys, maybe, a donkey and some sheep. Uh, there would have been, may have been a donkey as a guard animal for the sheep. But we've uh, switched from donkeys to uh, llamas. Mm -hmm. The llamas are gentler animals and just effective as guard animals. Uh, they, that is to say, they're gentler with the sheep. Um, I, I suppose you can make pets of llamas, but our llamas aren't pets. And I also remember um, it was a Sunday, and we took a walk through the woods and you seem to have a very close relationship with most of the trees in that woods and plans for that woods um, someday being a climax forest. But I also remember uh, a place in the hills where there was a stone, um, uh, stone place, lined place in the ground that former homesteaders used as cold storage or some kind of an ice. That's uh, right. Well, it's, it's what we called an ice house, which ice was house. Uh, simply a deep, large, cylindrical hole in the ground that would have had a, a roof over it. And um, people in that day took ice from the river and uh, filled that uh, hole in the ground with um, ice and covered it with sawdust. And so they had ice for cooling drinks and, and if not preserving meat, it wasn't a freezer, but it cooled and it extended the life of perishable foods. And uh, it, one of the interesting things that it shows was that people at the time that ice house was built uh, had a, de a dependable supply of winter ice from the river, which is no longer the case. Our river doesn't freeze over regularly anymore. Now, as a farmer, um, you learned to use draft horses a long time ago, and you have written extensively about draft horses for farming and forestry. Um, and I'm just wondering, how did you learn uh, the art of, of using draft horses? And where do you think our knowledge is today? I learned to, um, to drive, uh, draft animals. I began to learn before I remember. Mostly they were mules. Both my grandfathers were farmers and both uh, used mainly mules um, as draft animals. And uh, so I picked it up the way a kid picks up uh, a, a skill that's being used uh, on a daily basis by elders, um, so just in a natural way, as a kid begging, let me drive them. And uh, so if it was a, a safe place and not too much to worry about, uh, somebody would just hand you the uh, lines. And so I learned that way. And um, we used draft animals on up until probably about 19... About 1950 or so, about the time I got my driver's license, the uh, draft animals began to go from our part of the country to be replaced uh, on the smaller farms by small tractors. And uh, the pickup hay balers began to come in. But this was a planned transition, I think, uh, 
the great fulcrum of my life, and I think of modern history, was World War II uh, from an agricultural point of view. And uh, the end of World War II marked the time when we um, uh, transferred the chemical and mechanical technology of warfare to farming. And this was uh, a significant, uh, a significant event, the significance of which I've really spent my life trying to understand and articulate. But it meant that we, in the um, old days, so to speak, in the original story that I was born into and grew up in, we joined ourselves and our work to the land by means of animals that were sentient and intelligent and that uh, grew weary and suffered and died the way we did. And for them, we substituted uh, machinery to which none of that description applies. Uh, but this was a, a change from a creaturely existence to an existence uh, of which the dominant metaphor was the machine. And uh, the, well, I remember back in the, uh, in the 70s when I was working on the unsettling of America and trying to understand this very change and the significance of it and uh, to under, understand what this um, dominance of the, of the machine, the mechanical metaphor in defining existence and work and um, the dominance of uh, corporate power. Uh, my friend Mari Tallin and I uh, talked a lot about the good Amish farms that we knew. And I knew, uh, began to know good Amish farms and good Amish farmers by courtesy of Mari Tallin, who was uh, then editor and owner of the Draft Horse Journal. And Mari helped me to understand that the um, the um, draft animals um, were not simply that, but that their presence on the farm implied a pattern of um, uh, pastures, um, forage crops, fenced fields, and therefore other animals, and therefore uh, uh, the growing of feed and the production of manure, which meant that those farms uh, were producing a, a large measure of their attraction power, their uh, energy, and their fertility, which made for a kind of independence that I think was salutary and um, important to to agriculture. Well, to, uh, when we substituted machines for animals, that wasn't a simple substitution, but it replaced that old, diverse, uh, highly uh, 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 coherent, uh, intricately formal agriculture with a much simpler uh, uh, a way of farming that was, was uh, formally much simpler. And so uh, we came to specialized uh, an increasing acreage of um, uh, a few uh, row crops, dominantly, predominantly corn and beans in the Midwest. Um, grown uh, year after year in monoculture or in uh, uh, the, uh, the very uh, oversimplified rotation from corn to beans to corn to beans. 
the fences went, the other animals went uh, from the fields into uh, meat factories, uh, uh, con confined animal feeding operations. And uh, so the tractor, too, was a package deal. And it uh, mechanized agriculture uh, in a profound way, not just in the use of machines, but in the way we thought about uh, creatures and uh, the organization of farms, the, f the formal organization of farms, the integration of the parts. When I, when I think about um, horse powered agriculture. Um, I definitely feel like there are huge skill sets that are needed to take care of big animals. Um, you know, just because they're not, you know, it's not like a family pet. It's a, it's a big animal that could be dangerous. Um, I've been humbled by, I, I've, I've plowed a field behind, behind horses and my line, my, my rows were so squiggly and, and there was a little five-year-old kid who was doing it right after me who was just straight up and down and really just, he had the perfect balance on the plow. But um, I'm wondering, I mean, is it unrealistic to think that we could somehow gain back those many skills that it's needed just to do something as simple as you know, use uh, animal-powered traction? We can't do it quickly. Uh, when in the um, era of, of horse traction in farming, millions of people had those uh, skills that had come to them uh, without being consciously learned. And uh, that, that were, as you suggest, um, um, complex and, and uh, profound. That, uh, uh, w to the extent that we change back will depend on a number of things, um, but it, it will mean changing from a, um, a mechanical standard or a, a financial standard. Fi uh, we've been using financial or economic feasibility as a standard for agriculture for some time, but also mechanical efficiency, uh, we'll have to return to uh, ecological health as a standard, as a measure, and as a pattern to be imitated uh, before we're going to think seriously about um, uh, the, the way draft animals might fit in again. Now, there's some things, uh, there's, uh, uh, cautions that need to be expressed in regard to that. Some people who used draft animals in the past never should have done it. Uh, they lacked the gifts, they lacked the sympathy, um, uh, and a lot of cruelty and unnecessary suffering came about as a, as a, as a result. There has to be sympathy. But then there has to be a kind of sympathy in uh, the use even of plants. Um, a mechanical violence uh, um, as the direct way of solving problems in, in agriculture is a mistake. Uh, 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 there's a kind of a discreet and uh, um, discriminating forcefulness that, of course, is necessary. Uh, it all can't be done by a wave of the hand. Um, uh, force must be used. Strength must be used. But there's a difference between the use of strength and the use of violence. Violence totally disregards the creatureliness the uh, uh, sensitivity and the sensibility of the creature involved. So I don't like cruelty to plants, to trees. Uh, and there are ways of using uh, 
forests and fields that are essentially cruel, that completely disregard the creatureliness of the living things that are, that are in, involved. Uh, but as, as you suggested, there's danger in the use of, of animals for work. There's uh, danger in the use of any creature that's stronger and heavier than you are. So a certain amount of caution, a certain amount of respect is essential. There's always a, a sort of comedy in um, uh, the learning of uh, the, the use of animals, either for work or for meat production, um, <clears throat> because it, it, it involves the development of what you might call a uh, sixth sense, uh, feeling for the creature that you're, you're using. And I've noticed in teaching my own children and uh, grandchildren, if the driver of a team of horses is not confident of what he or she is saying, then the horses simply don't believe them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, it goes both ways, right? I mean, that, that communication, if they, if they have a vibe that you are uncomfortable, then you are, <laughs> you are up for that funny situation yes, of out of control. They sometimes know very quickly more about you than maybe you know about yourself. Well, um, in, in rereading uh, a number of the essays and bringing it to the table, I was really struck by the intricacies that you wrote about farming practices. A lot, a lot of the essays are, are a few de number of decades old, and you would go out on a farm and you would um, do a profile of someone that you admired. And you talked very, very... Um, uh, detailed about uh, crop rotations and plant and animal choices, about chemical use if there was any, and even about the amount of income that was being generated um, from a farm. And um, it seems to me that as a writer, those kinds of details have come easily to you, actually. There's, there's a delight in being able to use those details and to drive anything, whether it's a, po a poem or an essay or, or um, uh, a novel, short story. Um, when you were out there doing those pieces long ago, did you have to go back and forth with the authors to make sure that your details were right? Or were you a great note taker? Or um, how'd that come about? Well, I tried to be a good note taker. Uh, but in writing about uh, farmers and their work, if I didn't know them, if I didn't know the farm, I discovered that I needed to stay at least two days uh, to go and visit and talk and ask questions and take notes and so on. And, and I would always discover overnight that I'd missed uh, significant things, maybe the most significant thing. So I'd go back the next day mm -hmm. and start the conversation again and, and uh, look around again. Um, so there is, um, there's no way to speed up that kind of learning. The, I think the, uh, there were t two things that need to be said about the care with which I have written about the details of agriculture. One is that uh, the great cause of trouble in industrial agriculture is its oversimplification. Uh, the, the public generally um, oversimplifies the issue of food production. And I think the um, um, agri-science and agribusiness professionals have tended to oversimplify it. Um, to farm well requires an, uh, a, a very respectable intelligence 
And it requires, moreover, a highly developed formal intelligence to see how uh, the pieces fit together in order to be most coherent and, and mutually reinforcing and um, uh, mutually uh, supportive and serviceable to, to one another. But we've depreciated farming, uh, husbandry, pretty much the way we've depreciated what used to be called housewifery. And these are both grave and destructive injustices uh, to that uh, qualifier just has gone before farming and has gone before housewifery. He's, he's just a farmer or she's just a housewife to use the... Uh, the sexes that are usually associated with those roles, although they need not be. And in my experience, the, uh, the husbands and the wives cross back and forth with some frequency and ease from one role to another. Uh, but to speak of these people as just what they are, as if being a... Um, an industrial employee was somehow more sophisticated and intelligent and required more intelligence is wrong. So I've tried, uh, to, I've understood uh, my obligation as a writer about agriculture to, uh, to, to be the, um, uh, a justice to the real complexity of the work, the real complexity of what's involved and to, to try to mitigate this oversimplification. Uh, and I think I was, um, by my upbringing and experience, uh, prepared to, to do this because I've worked in farming all my, all my life. I haven't made a living from farming. It's necessary for me to say that. Um, but I've worked all my life with neighbors and others, family members too, who have made their living from farming. And uh, for many years, um, most of us are old or dead now, but th there was a, a very lively um, neighborhood that I was part of, and we went to help each other when, when the help was needed. Uh, for many years, uh, and we didn't uh, keep accounts or charge each other for our help. It, uh, the idea was we would go when we were needed, and uh, they would come when we needed them. And um, it was a lovely thing and, and uh, an ideal situation for a writer to live in because the conversation was so good, sometimes so funny. But uh, my son, who grew up in that neighborhood, when, we, when none of us ever went to the field for a difficult job of work alone, uh, the hay harvest, the tobacco harvest, whatever was going on, uh, my son now does uh, his hay harvest uh, alone mm -hmm. with, of course, uh, the necessary mechanical equipment. But that's not the real way for a farmer to live. Not the best way. Well, and and I think um, writing about farming as you've done for decades, um, this one of the themes that you consistently have to tackle, whether it's in a novel or an essay uh, or a poem, is the in, the lurking industrial economy, the industrialization of life of. Of, of work, of the household, of the food system. And in doing so, you've almost had to become an accountant and an economist. Mm. And I mean, did you ever think that that's the subject that you would tackle when you were studying uh, writing at Stanford with Wallace Stegner? <laughs> well, as a young man, of course, I was uh, as foolish as most young men. I thought I knew what I needed to know, which is an absurdity. 
And uh, as soon as I put myself to work as a sort of uh, critic of agriculture, I encountered not only uh, the issues of economy, um, but issues of science. And uh, so I've had to rely on my friends to a, a great extent. Uh, I still call my friend Wes Jackson on the telephone and say, can I say this? Or I call my brother sometimes about economic issues or political issues, and I say, can I say this? <laughs> and uh, uh, they are fairly exacting critics. Um, my brother, uh, I often think of my debt to my brother because he's, uh, he's a very intelligent man, and he has a way of letting you go so far and then saying, hang on a minute. And then introducing something into the um, um, process of thought that you hadn't anticipated, then you have to accommodate. So I, because of my ignorance about things that I've uh, obligated myself to know about, I've been a very dependent writer, and I have big debts to friends and relatives. That's very humbling. Um, yes. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's good to hear, actually. Um, and, and we should all be so thoughtful uh, as to find ways to really unravel and unpackage big issues for people to see in a new context. Well, what, what industrial agriculture has been is a kind of uh, sequence of simple solutions. If you want to pull a big load, get a tractor. Uh, if you want to kill a bug, get a poison, um, and so, so on. But uh, a part of the intricacy of the discussion of agriculture, and very few people who talk about agriculture um, have really confronted and dealt with this. If, if they did, uh, some of these people who are better trained than I it would have contributed better than I have to the discussion. But what you must never forget is that you're not talking just about agriculture. You're talking about uh, human culture. The, uh, you're talking about the human community uh, in which people live. And you're talking about the ecosystem in which they do their work. And uh, so any innovation has to come in, uh, if it's not going to do great harm, with due respect and forbearance toward these contexts of nature and uh, culture and the larger human economy. Um, this means that we must work uh, slowly at innovation if we're going to innovate. And we have to work on a proper scale so that when we fail, uh, the, we have a limited failure. Uh, what we've now committed ourselves to because of these uh, uh, simple solutions to complex problems, which are always wrong, uh, is a, a whole set of world scale of dangerous experiments in genetic engineering, nuclear uh, power, and so on. Uh, oh, uh, the uh, uh, electronic communication. Uh, well, you know, we've got people driving uh, semi trailer trucks at 70, 75 miles an hour on freeways uh, and at the same time using their computers or cell phones. Uh, you begin to wonder, wh where did this uh, homo sapiens business come from? And uh, the answer is that it came about, we had justly thought of ourselves as uh, having some intelligence when we were working on a scale and at speeds at which we were competent, 
that we could control, uh, limit the bad consequences of what we were doing. Uh, we're not homo sapiens uh, at the speeds and scale and power we're trying to work at now. We're really pretty limited, pretty dumb creatures. And I, I think that we are tyrannized by this concept of the free market and that this market is going to somehow supply all our needs. And um, a lot of your writing is about, um, you know, community sustaining patterns and patterns of subsistence. One of my, fa one of my favorite um, real um, essays that you've written, books that you've written on this subject is Harlan Hubbard. And I wondered if you could say a few words about Harlan Hubbard and, and his life. Um, Harlan Hubbard was a, a man uh, who was constitutionally uh, in love with living outdoors. He was an artist. Uh, he was intellectually lively and, and a reader of books. And uh, so, was, so was his wife, Anna. And um, um, they were musicians. They read together um, an astonishing uh, catalog of books they read together in their life together uh, in, in uh, uh, at least three languages. And um, uh, they played music together every day. Uh, Bach and Mozart and Brahms and so on. And um, I think Harlan had a new intuition that to make such a life possible, he had to live, as he put it, on the fringe of society, which meant living uh, on a rather remote uh, shore of the Ohio River, that you had to walk a mile down a steep hill to get to from the uh, Kentucky side or uh, uh, get to by rowboat from the Indiana side. And they had to restrict their technology uh, to mostly hand tools. It was mostly a 19th century uh, technology the remarkable thing was that uh, they did that, the, the work they did with that, uh, uh, as we would now think, uh, rather primitive technology. They worked, uh, we would say, very hard. But the odd thing about it was that this primitive um, uh, technology that ran mostly by uh, the, their own bodily strength and effort permitted them uh, the leisure to make art, play music, read to each other at length, and um, uh, sit down and talk with guests whenever guests came up. It was uh, really the only household that I've ever visited that uh, always had time to stop and say a few words when, when you went to visit. No telephone. Their one indulgence was an old automobile that they kept on the... Uh, uh, northern shore of the Ohio River, and they used it uh, for occasional shopping trips to Madison, Indiana, and to attend symphony concerts in Louisville. And maybe the most remarkable thing that they did, they didn't have an outboard motor, of course, because Harlan just wouldn't have um, uh, what he called the uh, stinking um, 
poly, polychromatic, stinking, small engines that humiliated him when they wouldn't start. Um, so they would row across the Ohio River, get into their car, drive to Louisville, which was a substantial trip, come home again in the middle of the night, and maybe in a fog, cross that wide river uh, unerringly to their own place. Uh, to cross the Ohio River in a fog, in a rowboat, in the middle of the night, uh, is a daunting undertaking. If you didn't have a, a, an accurate sense of direction, you could spend the night rowing in a circle <laughs> in the middle of the river and ne never see a thing uh, farther ahead maybe than the bow of the boat or the stern, depending on where you were sitting. That reminds me, I, I grew up not far from Amish country, and I knew a fair amount about Amish culture from my grandparents. And as I understand it, the Amish actually drove cars for a period up until when, when cars were first introduced, they accepted them slowly like everyone else. And then they made an adjustment. And, um, you know, however, they made their, their elderly decisions about where their community was going. They decided that that locomotion, locomotive technology had a negative effect on their communities. Yes. It would get them away from their communities faster um, than, than, was, than held them together. And um, they continued to use uh, motors uh, for things like combines and in their shops and things like that, but they would not use them for uh, locomotion. They would pull a motorized combine with, with horses or, or uh, draft animals. And, and they, they had an ability to um, set some limits on technologies and what they found acceptable and what not. Um, how, I think that you feel that there are definite limits that should be imposed on the food system. And, and maybe some of them come from Amish farming principles. Well, uh, uh, Amish technology would, uh, uh, their technological choices would uh, vary from one community to another. I, I don't know uh, an Amish community that uses a combine uh, with horses. That doesn't mean that they're not some. I do know Amish communities that use um, motor-driven pickup hay balers uh, with horses. And I even visited uh, one brilliant Amishman who had uh, um, made a or converted a John Deere pickup baler to ground drive with by adding a, uh, a binder bull wheel and uh, a set of gears and chains that made it work beautifully. I expected a gym crack. It was a, a brand new John Deere baler, and it, it worked wonderfully. Um, but the Amish uh, genius, which doesn't reside in any particular Amish, as I think genius tends not to do anyway, um, um, has been to ask an obvious uh, question that the rest of us have avoided. And that is uh, when they've been confronted with the need or wish for a technological innovation to ask, what will this do to our community? And if there's any uh, question about it, any fear at all, that it will detract from the integrity of the community or disemploy community members, they simply haven't done it. which seems to me to be just astonishingly wise and effective because uh, their communities have stayed intact. Mm -hmm. And they tend to be, um, by and large, the best farmers in the country, the most productive. I think the most productive county uh, west of the, uh, east of the Mississippi is uh, Lancaster County, Pennsylvania, uh, which is uh, farmed mostly by Amish. 
I'm from York County, the next county over. Um, well, you know. I do, I do. And, and um, you know, I wouldn't say that I, I feel that Amish, um, uh, to, you know, on the whole are the absolute best farmers, um, but certainly they're uh, the most resilient farming communities that I've ever seen. Um, and, and it brings me to this other, though, this principle that comes up in your writing quite a lot of um, letting the, the farm fit nature, um, this idea of local adaptation as definitely an influence on, on the farm. I think maybe that comes from um, not only being a good land steward yourself, but a, a lifetime of reading Sir Albert, uh, Albert Howard. Yes. Yes, um, that was the principle uh, that um, governed the, the experimental work and the, the thought of the English al uh, agriculturist Albert Howard. It also governed the work of J. Russell Smith uh, in his book Tree Crops, who said we must fit the farming to the farm. Uh, and all this is uh, confirmed, and it has been that kind of thinking has been carried on and, and uh, developed further, I think, by Wes Jackson and his colleagues at the Land Institute in Kansas. And their uh, principle of, of their work for uh, to develop perennial grain crops and better accounting. Uh, on the farm, energy accounting and so on, has been uh, that farming in Kansas should uh, imitate the nature and the processes of the native prairie, which means, uh, first of all, um, perennials grown in polyculture. So the ground's covered the, all the year. Uh, the root systems are f far deeper than the root systems of annual plants. And so uh, that uh, uh, di plant diversity, deep root, sy root systems and so on, yield obvious advantages. And, and um, you and Wes Jackson have uh, recently written an op-ed um, yes, we did. And it was calling for a 50-year farm bill that would really use this idea of perennially based agriculture as a, a national goal out into the future, 50 years out in the future. Maybe you can talk a little bit about that well, later. Well, that has uh, resulted in a, a, a document called a 50-year farm bill uh, that was uh, written by Wes and his people at the uh, land with, in collaboration with, and I think with the assent of a um, coalition of concerned individuals and groups uh, from all over the country, I attended uh, three or four preparatory meetings, one in, in Washington, one in San Francisco, two in North Carolina. And uh, Wes, being Wes, went to um, a good many more. Um, but that uh, farm bill has now been presented to the Secretary of Agriculture and um, uh, so I think it's safe to say that we're not going to have a 50-year farm bill immediately or perhaps very soon, but that this idea of a 50-year farm bill is now uh, a point of reference in the ongoing conversation, and it, w it will continue to be. The, uh, it's worthwhile to mention that uh, the aim of that farm bill was to address three problems 
One, soil erosion. Two, uh, is toxicity. And third is the decay and destruction of uh, rural communities, or as we sometimes call them, the, the uh, cultures of husbandry. And uh, the timetable of the 50-year farm bill is to uh, change the ratio of uh, perennial to annual uh, crops from 10% at present to 90% in 50 years. And, and we use those annual farm bill inputs of billions of dollars in order to bring those incentives onto the to, land. To the five-year farm bills would be uh, steps in the realization of this 50-year goal. And Wes has to become president in order for that to take place. What, what do we have to do to really start to be thinking so broadly and uh, forwardly in our big national agriculture policy that affects so much and seems to benefit so little? Well, uh, Dan, I'm, by policy, I refuse to answer questions like that because um, I don't know what we'll have to do. I don't know the answer. I don't know what, what we'll have to do or what the uh, stages or jobs of work uh, will, will be involved. Uh, all I can say is, and th this seems to me to be uh, legitimate and, and uh, honest enough, uh, we have to do, go a step at a time. We have to do the next obvious thing. And we've got to have our standards right. And the standards of the 50-year the, uh, the uh, farm bill is based on the standard of ecological health, keeping the ground covered, saving the water, uh, reducing uh, toxicity, uh, increasing diversity, maintaining the human communities, and so on. It's complex enough, in short. It's not another uh, simple answer. It's another uh, package deal, and the difference is that it knows it is. <laughs> um, I went back to uh, Kentucky two years ago to attend the uh, Healthy Farms, Healthy Food Conference that the Sierra Club puts on and you were part of. And I was really moved by how active you've been in, in the Louisville uh, local food network. And, and I remember you saying that you weren't really hopeful from the big national policy perspective, but you were very hopeful by what was going on locally. Well, I, am, uh, I do take hope from what uh, has happened locally there because we're uh, way ahead of where we were only a few years ago in a number of ways. We've got uh, many more farmers markets. We've got more community-supported agriculture farms. And we have secured the interest and cooperation of the Louisville city government um, in developing a local food economy from local food sources and involving local processing of local products. We've got a long way to go. Um, and I should say that, um, that I'm not really very much of an activist. Um, <laughs> what I've done uh, really hasn't involved all that much skill or, or knowledge. I've been a poker and a prodder. <laughs> and uh, have been pretty much at the beck and call of uh, people who are better activists and organizers than I am. When people call me up and say, look, we need you to do this or that, I really do make an effort to do this or that, as they say. So I'm, uh, uh, this Saturday of this week, uh, I'm going to speak at another uh, meeting of the uh, Healthy Farms Local Food Conference in Louisville. 
Well, I think it's really inspirational that 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 you would um, you know use your influence, however um, you feel, and and wherever necessary to because it because it felt to me that they'd had made this connection between the health of food, the health of the food system, and the health of people, and they recognized that a lot of their citizens weren't healthy. Well, it's uh, uh, something in addition to that also. Uh, we essentially said to the city government of Louisville, look, uh, Louisville is not Phoenix. It's in the middle of a fertile, well-watered, uh, uh, potentially highly productive uh, landscape that uh, could feed the people of Louisville. It could give them food security. Um, but we don't know the exact radius of the uh, uh, Louisville, the potential Louisville food shed, uh, but there is a radius within which uh, farmers could be uh, encouraged to produce for Louisville. Uh, we've um, so our question to you is: Do you have any use for us at all, except uh, to let your developers buy up our farms and build uh, suburbs on them? And uh, but to their credit, I think they've answered: um, Yes, we would like to develop. Um, a relationship with with our surrounding landscape that isn't exploitive or competitive, but rather cooperative. Mm -hmm. And so this is this is a new thing, and it's a, a very daunting economic problem. I don't know that anybody's ever solved the problem of how you make a demand and a supply come into existence simultaneously. So we're looking at that then feeling properly humbled I think hope so well we're getting near the end of this most excellent conversation and um, I'm grateful Wendell for your time um, I wonder if you might close with some words you're possibly asked this a lot uh, just to the young people out there who are considering um, a much closer relationship with their their food system by becoming involved as farmers and and gardeners and responsible eaters. Well, uh, Dan, this has been a pleasure to me too, and I'm glad to see you again. Uh, talking to young people imposes a very heavy responsibility. Uh, so there are some things to to say. The first question about young people getting involved in agriculture is, can you afford it? I've written by now maybe hundreds of letters, sometimes just telling people outright, don't do it. Uh, if you don't have the money, you don't know how, uh, don't put yourself and probably your marriage too at risk by uh, getting into something that you're very likely to fail at. So you need to ask, can you afford to do it? Uh, you need to ask, uh, are you willing to uh, buy a little place in the country and keep your city job uh, to pay for it with and begin gradually, say with a kitchen garden, and then go from that to a little flock of chickens properly fenced to keep the coons out and so on. Uh, until maybe you can make a transition to um, um, uh, uh, a farm that will participate in the local food economy and support you and uh, do an honest job of supporting your neighbors with good food. Uh, th these things are possible, but they, but they must be careful. The other uh, thing to worry about is, of course, uh, ignorance. Uh, it's, uh, people who don't know about farming are easily influenced by romantic visions of the simple life 
in the country. And I can tell you that if you're going to be even self-supporting in a rural landscape or you're going to produce uh, anything for the market, uh, and uh, you're leaving a city existence to do that, you'll be moving from a simple life to one that's extremely complex and demanding. It's much simpler to buy your groceries than it is to grow them. Uh, the other mistake is, uh, the opposite one, is to assume that your country neighbors who are just farmers and uh, just wives don't have anything to teach you. So uh, the thing to do when you have a question is uh, try to get it answered by asking your neighbors first. You may not agree, uh, but you'll learn something probably that you need to know. So uh, I don't have any doubt that we need more people in farming than we now have. Wes Jackson talks about uh, the necessity of a right ratio of eyes to acres. That is to say we need uh, people capable not only of causing the land to produce, which you can do by a kind of force or a kind of rape, but people capable of watching over the land and uh, maintaining it well and preserving it, improving it, even while you uh, bring forth food and other necessities from it. Uh, I often think of something that Henry Bassoudin told me. He, uh, Henry Bassoudin was our great uh, south, south Down sheep breeder in Kentucky and, and a, a splendid farmer. Uh, but Henry told me one time about uh, a farmer he knew who never wiped the manure off his feet without trying to find the poorest spot in a pasture to wipe them. And I've tried to live up to that. If you've come out of the barn with manure on your feet, look around. If you've got a bare spot or a place where the grass is weak or thin, go there and wipe the manure off. That's the kind of thinking. That's the kind of uh, uh, act of love that real farming calls for. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Hey, this is Michael. As you know, Flipping the Table is sponsored by Roots of Change. You can keep our program going by making a contribution to Roots of Change through our website, rootsofchange.org.